I'm going to start uh, with Paul Davies. Uh, he's a theoretical physicist. He's currently at Arizona State University. Um, many of you who follow popular science may have read a book he wrote several years ago on the nature of time. It was a seminal work. I certainly read it. He's also very interested in astrobiology and you know, looking at how physics relates to cancer research and other things. Uh, we're delighted to have him here uh, to talk about uh, some of these deep questions on the nature of time. Thank you, Jennifer. Are you going to ask me a question? No, I'm going to have you talk a little bit about uh, oh, the specifics right. of your work and uh, right, right. let them well, get... Well, you can, you can see from looking at the other panelists <laughs> that I'm the old timer on, on the panel. And I've been in this game uh, ever since I he heard Fred Hoyle, the great uh, British cosmologist, talk at the Royal Society in 1968 about why the future and the past seem different and how we might recover that from the symmetry of the laws of physics. And so that became part of my PhD thesis. I then went on and wrote a book about time asymmetry in 1974. And so I've uh, followed that subject. It's ins and outs ever since. Some people have asked me, have we learned much since 1974? Are we just revisiting the same old topics? We've learned a few things, but I think the fundamental problems remain. We think uh, the cause of the time asymmetry in the world, the so-called arrow of time, must be traced back to cosmology. It's got something to do with how the universe began. But then that immediately opens up a Pandora's box of many different competing stories about how the universe began, and they all come with a different resolution of this time uh, issue. But in addition to the origin of time, there is the question of the nature of time. Uh, that is, questions like, in daily life, we have this overwhelming impression that there is some special moment singled out, which we call now. Uh, and when you stand back and look at physics, we don't see a now. There's nothing in the equations of physics to say this moment is special. And furthermore, we see nothing that conveys that now from past to future. It's not like uh, we have equations describing how fast time moves. Because if I ask you the question, how fast does time move? Well, of course you know the answer, one second per second. <laughs> Doesn't tell us anything. So. Uh, it, a, lo a lot of scientists and philosophers have come to the conclusion that this overwhelming impression we have in daily life of a flux or movement of time, a river of time and many metaphors, is an illusion or a confusion or something like that. It's something cooked up in our brains. Uh, and I've long wondered whether that's too simple an answer, whether we really are missing something fundamental about time. So that, that is one area that I think is still and pretty mysterious. There's another issue which is a bit more technical, I, I'll just very briefly touch on it, which is um, and, uh, John, John Wheeler, who was a sort of hero of mine, uh, expressed it so well. He said, if you ask an atom about the direction of time, it will laugh in your face. <laughs> what he meant by that was down at the level of atoms, there is no arrow of time. Two atoms bounce together, bounce off each other, you run the movie backwards, all looks the same. It's only when you put a large assemblage of atoms together and ignore all the little details and look at the gross averaged out behavior of the whole thing that we see this strong arrow of time. So for example, if you have two gases, you have a, um, a, a cylinder of gas over here, a cylinder of a different gas over there, a red one and a blue one, put them together and open it up, they'll diffuse and intermingle and you can't undo them again just so you can't get the wine out of the, sh the shirt. Uh, our next panelist is uh, Tim Modlin. I'm going to let him tell you a little bit about himself, and maybe you can also uh, riff a little bit on what Paul was talking about, um, the different ways we define time, what is time, and you know, also the question of, can we say it exists? So if we look back at the history of philosophy, you find uh, philosophers said awfully strange things about time before anybody else did. Um, <laughs> Parmenides already said time was an illusion and nothing really changes. Um, Kant said that time is some kind of invention of the mind that we impose upon the world. It's all in your head, it's not out there. Um, so you might expect me to be saying really weird stuff, but there's been this strange inversion in culture now um, where the physicists are now saying really weird stuff. And, and I'm here to tell you everything's okay. Um, it, 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 when you say I'm, I'm, not, I'm not interested in philosophical aspects of time in any deep way, I think that then would separate me from, from Paul or, or any of the other physicists here. Um, as a philosopher, I'm just interested in the nature of things and what they are. And I got interested in the philosophy of physics because I was interested in the physical world and wanted to know what it was. If I ask you to say what a piano is, 
you'd sort of know how to go about it, because you'd say, well, it's an instrument, it has keys, it has strings. Because it's a composite object, it's made up of other things, and I can tell you what it is by breaking it down into these parts and saying how the parts are arranged and how they work together. And you come to understand it that way. But that process can't go on forever. You've got to get down to some basic objects or structures under which there are no further structures from which they arise. And when I ask you what they are, of course, I can't give you the same kind of answer because it doesn't exist. Rather, I, un I, I understand it by understanding how other things depend on it rather than how it depends on other things. And I guess I think time is sort of like that. I think it, it is there. It's basic. I think it actually has a direction. I think we're actually objectively getting older. Uh, next, we have uh, Raisa D'Souza. And when I looked at her, uh, her, uh, her bio, I, I came to her and said, I don't actually know how to describe you. And she said, you can call me a refugee physicist. <laughs> uh, she's at the uh, University of California, Davis, and also at the Santa Fe Institute. She studies social networking, self-organization networks, emergent complex systems, and uh, things like phase transitions. And uh, there certainly is a temporal aspect, an aspect of time to, you know, that, that plays an important role in those kinds of research. So I'll let you tell the audience a little bit about that. Great. And so I do study complex systems, and uh, I really like what Paul said, how two elements alone interacting, two particles, is really different than a collection of them. And that's what we really study in complex systems, is how simple things can come together, and interacting just on their own in a decentralized manner can give rise to structure. So what kind of structure am I thinking? I'm thinking of patterns, I'm thinking of synchronization, I'm thinking of phase transitions. So we might think about how early in the evening in certain uh, locations there's fireflies in the trees and they start blinking and they're totally random and out of phase and over the course of a few minutes they all start synchronizing together in a big wave. And it all happens through local ordering and there's nothing there that's guiding them. So it's sort of an emergent property that we see come out of this local behavior. Uh, we've exchanged some emails, Jennifer and I, so our email relied on having the physical internet there to transmit the packets, which relies on having the power grid in place, which relies in terms on having cooling water and communication networks. So we have these large networks that are really part of our daily life, and we still haven't come up with very principled ways of dealing with them, let alone the emergent properties that happen when we bring these objects that on their own are very complicated, together in new ways and how that changes things like their emergent properties and their phase transitions. But to me, I've been dealing more with real systems, engineered systems at the macroscopic level, so really not at the quantum scale. So to me, I see time as the increase in complexity in the world around us. And I see the increased interdependence of all these systems that may have been more isolated in the past and we're really at a time that we're seeing them come together. So I think that's very exciting. And last, but far from least, we have David Eagleman. Uh, he's a neuroscientist. So I've spent the last 11 years really digging down into this and trying to figure out what it means that time is not something we're passively tracking, but instead something we're actively constructing. When you interact with the world, I suggest what you're actually doing is recalibrating your time perception. Because when you interact like this, you send out a motor act, and you feel it, and you see it, and you hear the sensory feedback from that. It turns out that the sensory feedback comes into very different channels, and your brain has to figure out, well, given that it took me some tens or hundreds of milliseconds to get this information, and this information, and process that information, how do I know what actually went with what in the outside world? One of the consequences of all this, the fact that, um, it takes time to process signals, is that we live quite a, quite a ways in the past, much more than you would think. So by the time you have a conscious narrative of the moment now, it's already, it's already gone. It's still gone a long time ago. It turns out that your motor systems can react much faster. So if, uh, if a, a big lion comes up the stairs all of a sudden, you're already moving your motor system by the time you become consciously aware that anything interesting is happening because you have uh, fibers that peel off from your optic nerve and go straight to other parts of your brain underneath the cortex that send signals straight to the motor system and out and you can already be reacting pre-consciously. Consciousness, it turns out, is the slowest one. It's the last guy on the ladder to hear any of the information. And I think there's a real clue there, which is that 
the reason we have conscious perception is so that we can build up a story of what's happening in the outside world so that we can use that for future planning. Most of the things that we see and experience are actually quite ambiguous. Consciousness goes through a lot of trouble to take all the signals, stitch them together, come up with a single coherent story about what just happened and serve that up to you. The cost is, it takes time. It takes time and so we're always living a bit in the past. David, you have that experience when you're startled by a telephone that you jump a fraction of a second before you actually hear it. I want to build on something that, that David said very, at the very beginning and just kind of throw it out to all the panelists. And uh, let's talk a little bit about that tension between our perception of time and how we as scientists, or you as scientists, guard against, you know, letting that influence your science. You know, where, where do you separate the subjective, our, our subjective experience of time and the objective reality of it? Me first. Well, no, right, right, whoever right, wants to right, jump in, you well, need no, <laughs> it's, So I was talking about how in physics there's a sort of time scape, or sometimes called block time, that space is laid out like the landscape, like a map, and time is laid out, uh, but it's there. And there are events, points in space-time are events. And, uh, there's a story going on, but it, nothing's actually happening. And, uh, and it's a very curious thing that in the history of theology, because you saw that Augustine, theologians, thought about this uh, for a long time, um, and there was this, uh, this, this debate going on, sort of resolved. Is God inside of time or outside of time? Is God a perfectly uh, a timeless, uh, lay temporal being, transcending time, or embedded in the stream of time? And so that's, that's an issue that goes backwards and forwards. So if you had a God's eye view, and you were a classical uh, Christian type God, you would, you would have no time. You just lord it over the entire timescape and landscape. But if you were the god of the process theologian, you've been embedded in it along with us and carried along by, by events. So this, uh, these ideas are, are, going, are very ancient. Uh, and so a lot of what we've been talking about at this uh, meeting is going beyond the notion that time magically switched on. There was some magic moment that set it all going. It may be, if you did take this God's eye view, there is some eternity, but our, at what we call our universe had a beginning in time, and it has a life cycle, it has a, a birth, uh, evolution, and maybe one day a death. But stand outside that in this bigger multiverse, this bigger embedding entity, uh, and that could be eternal. That's just what people are talking about at the moment. 20 years ago, everyone wanted time to start with the Big Bang. <laughs> um, uh, so let me, uh, again, in, in my role, I guess, as philosopher, um, the sorts of metaphor, I guess you have to think a bit about this uh, metaphor of what is the view from nowhere. I, I, I guess I think those metaphors um, can be extremely misleading and unhelpful. What you're suggesting a person do is imagine being outside of something that is spatially located to it, but distant from it, looking down on it. What is this thing I'm looking down on it? Well, you've told me it's a block. Um, I'm imagining myself watching a block, and blocks don't move, right? They're sort of, they are static objects, a brick, right? I, I, I know what the experience is like to, to, to look at a brick. It's not much fun. Um, <laughs> and if you ask me about that object, I'd say, gee, there's nothing very temporally interesting going on there, right? Um, no interesting time. But, because you've asked me to think about the experience of watching something that you've told me is, has no time. I don't know what it means to say I want to understand the universe from the outside. I'm perfectly happy to understand it from the inside. And I think from the inside, really, time does flow. Um, there's nothing, this idea there's no special now. There's no, of course, as it were, objective special now that's special at all times. Um, the present time is special now, and now a different time is special now. Um, the specialness, as it were, tracks along with the time. So I'll give you two different hats about how my personal experience and my science have different views of time. So the first one will be my physics hat. And statistical physics always tells us that things are going to equilibrium. So that's what I expect the arrow of time to be, is that we see things getting more typical members of what would be consistent with some observable that we have. Maybe it's the temperature in the room or the number of connections in my network. So we expect things to evolve towards typicality. Yet when I look at real world systems, I normally see that they're very atypical. So the internet is nothing like a random network that would have those same properties. And it evolves in a way that's very guided. And now I'll put my computer scientist hat on. 
And one of the things that we think about a lot is algorithms. We normally judge the complexity of an algorithm by how many bits we need to encode the information and the processing and how long it takes. So the time that it takes to run an algorithm is very important, how it scales with the size of the input. But just because my algorithm is taking a long time doesn't mean that I didn't write a bad one. <laughs> so, so I'm sure we've all had this experience that we've written some code at some place and it takes forever and ever and keeps running and it doesn't necessarily mean that that was a very complicated set of instructions, it's just that my personal experience hasn't guided me towards a good one. The difficulty of course for us is that we are like, um, we're like a fish in water trying to describe water. We are stuck in time. Uh, so just like Tim's saying, we're stuck there, it's so elemental, it's hard to know how to even describe it, but a fish would have a better chance of describing water if a bubble comes up past it and it says, that's weird, what is that? And that's what illusions are like for us. In fact, I, I feel like visual illusions are really interesting to third graders and then to neuroscientists when they grow up <laughs> because what it tells us is, wow, we know we can set this thing out here and yet you perceive it differently. So now all of a sudden there's something in the water that tells us that uh, that something funny is there. I want to remind everybody that we do have microphones here for questions. Uh, feel free to come down. Yeah. And we did get a question in via Twitter that I'm going to throw out, um, particularly to the physicists, I think that this will be particularly relevant. Um, it's the question of, does, can time have more than one dimension? And uh, just by way of explanation, if you think of uh, time in our, the way we conventionally think about it in physics, there are three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. But uh, certainly I think uh, Paul and Tim and Raisa can, can tell us that in fact there are some physics theories that have postulated the existence of more than one dimension of time. So I will just throw it out there to the panel. Shall I, shall I go first? You go. Um, so you might think that the thing that Tim and I have been squabbling over, you, you know, is there a now and what does it mean to say that uh, time passes, how fast does it pass and so on, could be resolved by having a second time dimension. So we can say, ah, oh, now it uh, is meaningful to say that time moves at a certain speed relative to this other time dimension. And you think, well, perhaps that solved the problem. And then you start worrying about, well, what about the movement of time in this other dimension? So we need a third and a fourth and so on. I think this is, again, there's, there's a kind of a, a philosophical moment when some of this discussion began where some philosophical mistakes were made. And there was a mistake made in philosophy that said that trivial things can't have any meaning, right? But that's not correct. They, they may be trivial, but true. I mean, the nice thing about trivial things is they're often true. There's been some slight speculation of a different sense in which time could have two dimensions, a sort of mathematical sense where you take a relativistic structure where you have, say, the four dimensions in special relativity. In a certain sense, three are of one type and one is of another type. And the three of the one type we call space-like one of the other type we call timeline. And just as a mathematical matter, you could ask, well, what if I used an analogous mathematical gadget where there were two of one type and three or two and four? Um, that's a good mathematical question. As far as I know, no one's made any physics out of it. I mean, we'd certainly like, um, we'd certainly like to know the answer to this. <laughs> so it's so tough being stuck inside our subjective world because we just don't know if in the middle of my last sentence, time froze for 10,000 years and then started up again. We just, we just wouldn't know. And if there was some way to get onto a different dimension and see from the outside, that would be lovely. <laughs> Remark on something that Tim said, which I think uh, we probably all experienced because uh, you're saying, how much older am I gonna be in a year? Well, duh, I'll have another birthday, I'll be a year older. But we all notice that aging is a very relative thing. So some of us age more quickly than others. So even though I'm a year older, my internal clock might be running right. at a different rate than yours. Right, I, I mean, absolutely. I, I mean, I do want to say, there, people talk about different times in a completely comprehensible way. David works with subjective time and wants to understand the relation of it to objective time in the way one could do with space, right? You, so you might have a naive picture that my perception of space is just a simple function of what's hitting my retina, but like me, when I get new glasses, I mean, you have the same kind of experience. When I first put them on, everything seems strange and I can't walk and it takes me a few days to acclimatize and what's hitting my retina is the same, but my brain has adjusted so that my experience of the space is now different. Biological transformations, uh, phase transitions, 
you can say they have their own internal time scales and relate those to objective time scale. And those are all fascinating questions. They're just different from the one that sort of sits on this side of the table mostly, which is just, let's take the one physics time and think about it, can we understand it better? Uh, and then you have a different job of relating it to these other sorts of times. Um, I'm going to uh, ask you a question about computer time, and particularly in, in the modern world where we have so many virtual environments, um, that's a very interesting question. So how does time work inside a computer? So, and, and that's probably got something to do with um, evolution over time, because circuits are getting faster and faster. Some of us are, are working on quantum information and quantum computing, and this is certainly something that we grapple with all the time. If someone can build a quantum computer and do something really fast that we don't know how to do with classical computers, does that mean that quantum computers have that much more power, or is it that we just haven't been clever enough to find the right algorithm that would let us do the same thing? So this is gonna be an interesting challenge to classical algorithms people if anyone ever does come implement a quantum algorithm at a larger scale. Um, I, certainly, uh, I think that the, the, the physicists here can, can uh, th there are certainly theories out there about how, you know, is the, com is the universe a computer simulation? I, th I know Seth Lloyd has written about a computational approach to cosmology. Um, perhaps uh, Paul and, uh, and, and Tim can comment on so, that. So the idea here is that uh, we can imagine, and it maybe in a thousand years, having computers of such power that not only are they conscious, but they could be uh, as it were, inhabited by many conscious beings, we could create a world for them, a virtual world. And if this got uh, really good, if we had the money to generate convincing scenarios, then these uh, poor little entities uh, would, wouldn't know that they're simulated in our computers. Uh, and then you start fretting about, well, maybe they'll get bored and switch off, or maybe they'll run out of funds and pull the plug. You know, all of these things uh, could happen. But, it, but it's a, a, a very interesting thing to think about. How would we know? And about the only, this John Barrow came up with this idea, well, maybe, you know, if the people, not people, but the entities running the simulation uh, were a bit short of cash, maybe they cut a few corners and we'd see the scenery wobbling, so to speak. So perhaps if we look very carefully at nature, we'll see a few glitches. Um, <laughs> and, and I remember that scene in the nature. Yes. So it leads to, you know, very interesting, I, I uh, proposed uh, some years ago a sort of reductio ad absurdum for the whole multiverse idea. So the multiverse says, this is just one universe and there's a stupendous number, probably an infinite number of other universes. Well, in some of these at least, uh, there would be communities like us that would be sufficiently advanced to be able to start simulating other universes for themselves. Now, the point about simulated universes is a lot cheaper than the real thing. If you ask me to, you know, to make something like this, I'd need a big budget, but making a simulated uh, version is a lot cheaper, particularly if you can cut a few corners. Uh, the fake universes, if we call them that, would very rapidly proliferate to outnumber the real ones. And now if you believe that we are just arbitrary observers, there's nothing special about us, we're just sort of randomly plucked um, uh, out, out of the set of all observers, then it becomes overwhelmingly more likely that we're living in a simulation. But there is a catch now, because when we come up with all these wonderful conjectures about the multiverse, which we talked about the last few days, that's based on our best understanding of physics in this world. But if this world's a fake, the laws of this world are fake as well. The simulators are giving us fake laws, but it actually gets worse because, um, <laughs> because uh, it's well known that you know, a Turing machine can simulate another Turing machine, which is to say a universal computer. You don't know, there may be an infinite stack of simulations within simulations within simulations. Um, so if you've got all these different universes, all possible varieties, all fake, all, all other possibilities, some of them will have gods, some of the gods will be fake, some of them will be real, the theology of this uh, pantheon is uh, something quite mind-boggling. <laughs> we have someone who's been waiting very patiently to ask a question. It's wonderful hearing all these arguments among you because it's insight into how science works. I had a question for David Eagleman, and that's about how our temporal perception of the world operates when we play music or go dancing, for example. I know when I play music, I almost feel I'm part of a super organism that's bigger than I am. Like, the drum causes the whole thing to operate. You mean when you're playing with other people? Exactly, when I'm playing yeah. music in a band. And I'm wondering if the, the, the rhythm is something that's helping to glue that, that sense of, larger sense of self together. Is, why do we tap our feet when we listen to music? Is that, since there's something temporal in our experience of music. Yeah, quite right. Thanks for that question. 
Uh, the neuroscience of music is a little bit out of my area of expertise, but I will say that the brain is really good at predicting ahead. It's always trying to predict and match sensory feedback. So when you're given something like a rhythm, if you can get yourself into that rhythm, then all of your expectations are being met. And as came up earlier today at the conference, there's something very rewarding to the brain about that. The reason being that having an expectation violated costs energy. And it seems that, and this is my hypothesis on it, is that that's tied into punishment and reward systems in the brain. If you're doing things that reduce the energy expenditure, that feels really good. And if you're spending more energy, that feels bad. Moreover, when you're playing with other people, you have this extraordinary experience where you're doing some motor output, and the sensory feedback is much richer than you could normally do yourself. And I think this is probably the secret behind getting people all pumped up for war, for example. You have all these 18-year-old kids marching and bellowing in concert, and so your motor outputs are being met by this thunderous sensory feedback, and so you feel like yourself has grown 10,000-fold. Thanks for that question. Cool. Is there any others there? Yeah. Yep. Okay, good. Yeah, I'd like to ask each of you if time can be circular. Ooh. Well, well. <laughs> Take it away. <laughs> I wrote a paper in 1972. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to write one again. <laughs> 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 George and I were, were contemporaries in Cambridge in, uh, in those days, and so uh, uh, and we'd uh, talk about things like that. Um, and uh, yes, you could you could do that. Now, there's a, the problem. Yeah, there's nothing to prevent you uh, having topologically closed time. The problem comes with what we've been talking about mainly at this conference, the arrow of time, because if everything is um, heading in one direction, like downhill or something, uh, if you're going to go around in a loop, you've somehow got to get back to the starting point, and it's all got to fit together self-consistently. That's a difficult thing uh, to do in the, the, the universe that we see at the moment. But we could imagine, and I'll tell you what I imagined in 1972, that the universe expands, reaches some sort of maximum size, contracts again to what you think is going to be a big crunch. So a big bang starts it off, big crunch finishes it off. But it's actually just a big bounce. And then you get another cycle of expansion and contraction. And the end of the second one, you join with the beginning of the first one. And the reason that you, you need two is so when you get to that big uh, bounce, all of the information in the universe is sort of wiped out and mashed up and scrambled up. So you uh, sort of set the, set the, it's a tabula rasa you start off with in the second cycle. And then you can, and there are a number of ways you could, you could do that, but you have to get the thermodynamics right. But that would lead to a different reality the second time around, right? Because a lot of events are... You see, you're falling for this flaring time thing. There is no second time around. There it is. It's closed time. But you're thinking we're going around it like this. And around we go again. You're not going anywhere. <laughs> 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 but, but, but the, the, the different planes. So if I were to take a slice of time, yeah. or a slice of a state yep. in the first bubble, and then in the second bubble, I would see that different random events had yeah. happened. No, no, these two, the, this is not, we go through the world and then we go through it a second time. No, this is, we go through the world with everything, with entropy going one way and things running down, then we scrunch everything up, and then in the next one, the arrow of time is reversed. So that the end of the second cycle, you get yourself back to the beginning. Now, some people try to work this in just one cycle. They say, well, entropy will go up so long as the universe expands. When the universe starts to contract, it will come down again, so we will end up, and Hugh Price here as a, as a model like that, Tommy Gold did, and Stephen Hawking did, but then retracted and called it his greatest mistake. So it's this idea that the time goes around, comes around, again and again. Um, it's, it's technically hard to make it work just in one cycle of expansion and contraction, which is why I wanted the, the two with the bounce. But, uh, but at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. These technical details, you can close it into a loop, so long as you can sort out the thermodynamics. So can, can I make a comment, because even again and again, is it? Um, there are two things one might have in mind, and this is, corresponds to what you were thinking, I think. One is, and, and these are mathematically different, so here, again, I want to make a distinction, because I think it's very central to understanding things, between the mathematical representations we use in physics and physics. <laughs> okay, so the, the thing that there's not any question about is that we can construct mathematical objects 
that have the features that we use in normal physics, say general relativity. Um, in one case where it's literally closed, so it's not that anything happens more than once, it's like in, in a donut, right? There's only so much of it there, um, it just closes back on itself. Or you could pass to what's called the covering space where you essentially really do have an infinite number of distinct epochs that succeed each other, but might look exactly the same. I mean, they might, as it were, be replays, qualitative replays over and over. Those are, math those are mathematically distinct objects because in, in one case, there's only one event of a certain kind. In the other case, there are an infinite number of copies of that. There are a couple questions here. One is, did I just give you two different physical possibilities, right? That is one where there's a, really a looped around one thing and one where there's an infinite number of copies. Some physicists now will raise their fists and say, no, 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 those are really the same because they're observationally equivalent or there's some mapping from one to the other. Then you're saying, well, they're certainly mathematically different, right? These are different mathematical objects. There's not a one-to-one -one correlation between the mathematical representations and the physics they represent. Um, I think it's a, deeper than that. I think it, it, if time has a certain, if time as a thing has a certain kind of nature, then the going around in a circle isn't possible for it. Right? That's not the kind of thing time can do. <laughs> Whereas the, repeating, no problem with that because it continues to have this sort of linear structure. So there's a kind of pattern we, we seem to have a lot in science where we, we start off thinking some everyday concept is part of the fundamental furniture of the world and then we start thinking it doesn't exist at all and then we kind of settle down and we realise that actually, sure it exists but it's not fundamental. So something like, you know, first, at first we thought there were solid objects and then we found out about electrons and atoms and we, and we for a, a little, like, little while we got careless and we said, right, but there aren't any solid objects at all. And then we kind of came to our senses and we said, yeah, there are solid objects, it's just that Solidity is not one of the fundamental properties of the world. We can analyze it in terms of other stuff. That, and so the fundamental language of the world doesn't contain solidity. So the question to the panel, is there something special about time? Is time something that somehow has a special right not to get analyzed in terms of more fundamental concepts that don't include time? Or is time just something that might turn out to be like solidity? Yeah, well, David's question is a very interesting one, and I know you asked it from the point of view of physics, but from the point of view of the brain, what we're seeing is a fragmentation of time into a number of different mechanisms that all care about different aspects of it. So for example, there are uh, mechanisms in your brain that care about answering the question of duration. And those are separable. You can tease those apart from those that care about temporal order, those that care about the rate of flicker, those that care about simultaneity versus successiveness. And normally, because the world behaves in some nice way that we're used to, all of those things go together. So we say, oh yes, well, if the duration expanded, that means it also came on. Uh, before and it turned off later and that means the flicker rate should change accordingly and so on and and we're very used to this thinking about it like a movie where if you stretch out a part of a movie into slow motion then you have all these consequences of that the pitch goes down and and the flickering sirens slow down and so on that's what happens in a movie it's not what happens in the brain so normally all these systems work in concert but if we work very carefully we can tease these apart and so I sort of think the notion of time, at least from the neural point of view, is going to fragment into other things and it won't last as sort of the fundamental unitary thing that we intuit it to be. Excellent. We have a question over here. Uh, yeah, this is uh, a question for Paul Davis and uh, Tim Modlin. Um, or maybe a comment and then a question. Uh, it seems like uh, uh, Paul is taking a rather strong position that uh, time the flow of time, at least, doesn't seem to exist, that it's just an illusion. And um, Tim is saying that uh, it may not be illu illu an illusion, but he's quite happy that the flow of time is not captured in today's physics. I think um, Paul's position is quite dangerous, and Tim still is not too far from that. Now, how can, if suppose for, for just for a second, that the flow of time were becoming is a real feature of the world. How can one even imagine a theory of everything if you take such a strong, strong position as Paul and uh, not so strong, strong, but still strong position as Tim? Well, um, I, I think the position I'm taking is the standard party line among <laughs> theoretical physicists. And I uh, must admit I learnt it from uh, reading philosophy rather than physics, but I then found that most physicists uh, were one step ahead of me. Uh, 
so many philosophers who took this uh, position, and, uh, and I uh, was exposed to their work very early on in my career. So um, I, uh, I, de I don't think anybody that I, when you use this term theory of everything, it's a much misused term. I mean, most of it refers to uh, some sort of grand unification of the fundamental forces of nature, and nobody would pretend that that is a theory of literally everything. It wouldn't, for example, explain why people fall in love or vote the way they do in elections. It, it doesn't pretend to do that. It's a very reductionistic uh, notion of a theory of everything. Now, if it turns out that there is a missing ingredient about time itself, not our perception of time, but time itself, roughly associated with this uh, vexed issue of flux or flow, then of course, if we're to have a proper description of the world, we have to incorporate it. Uh, but so far, not only have we seen no sign of anything corresponding to it in physics, it really is very hard, as I think Tim has made this point too, very hard to even make sense of what we mean by it. Uh, and so, uh, basically, I disagree with what the speaker said. <laughs> <laughs> so, let me say, um, I mean, the, the, the position he described to me isn't, isn't, isn't quite correct. So, um, I think it's a, it, it is a live and very plausible possibility um, that, that the direction of time, the, the asymmetry of time, what, anything I could make sense of as the flow of time, um, and in a way that most physicists here would, would reject, so this is not a trivial observation, is objective, uh, is part of the real world. The asymmetry, yes. The asymmetry, asymmetry yeah, right? Not that, flat. The but, asymmetry. But, but the, everything about flow, right, the, the, the asymmetry is just intrinsic to the geometry of space time. It's independent, say, of the entropy gradient. So I, could, I can reasonably say entropy could go down. Right, could decrease, where decrease means you're going forward in time and the entropy is going down in time. So lots of people would say, no, no, you can't make any sense of that because the direction of forward in time just is the direction of increasing Well, that's there, uh, okay. I mentioned impression, my yeah, yeah. So I, I think they're separate. I'm sort of on Newton's side here. So you, um, could, you could imagine a situation in which you saw the great cosmic movie running back. Well, uh, uh, of course, watching a movie running backward is not having the mental state of watching the movie running forward, going backward. I mean, you have to sort of think, <laughs> right? You That's wouldn't see anything because the light would be going yeah, wrong. Yeah, no, I you know, um, uh, uh, Anyway, um, so I think, uh, I, I think it, 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 there's every reason to believe it's part of physical reality. Uh, I don't think there's a lot of difficulty getting it into the mathematical representation, right? I, I mean, I'm doing a little bit of mathematics myself to make it more obvious, but even without it, it would be a kind of rather trivial thing to put it into the mathematics. It's just a matter of picking a particular orientation and saying it's special. Now, I think there is a confusion here when people say, oh, but um, I pick out a direction in this manifold thing, mathematical manifold that I'm dealing with, and say that's the forward direction in time. Uh, I, I can't see in the arrow you've put, how do I get the, the timiness out of that? But I think that's just an, error, just, just an error, the same way you would say, well, I want a mathematical representation of the mass of things. Well, I use a scalar. And I want a mathematical representation of temperature. Well, I use another scalar. And they say, but look, you know, you're using two mathematical objects. What makes one ma mass and what makes the other temperature? And the answer is, well, because that's a convention. of This is a representation. And there's a convention that says I'm going to use this number for this and that number for that. The numbers aren't literally like the things, right? Um, uh, in, in that sense, that you can stare at the mathematical objects. <laughs> um, so I, I think sometimes people are expecting too much from the mathematics as mathematics. If you bring those expectations down to where they ought to be, it's not hard to meet them. Um, but there really is a physical hypothesis here, that there's an intrinsic asymmetry in the geometry of space-time that isn't reducible to, say, the distribution of matter. Um, I want to uh, change gears a little bit and talk about uh, different kinds of time, uh, get back to uh, the flow of time, this notion that we have, our, our sense of experiencing flow. I know in David's talk, you, you talked a lot about how when people you know, are in a serious, frightening situation, time seems to slow down. They have that phenomenon of their life flashing before their eyes. Um, I think the comedian Janine Garofalo has referred to something called Stairmaster time, which is that if you're on a Stairmaster doing exercise, it just an hour is like an eternity. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and Raisa and I were talking. You know, she she rock climbs, and there, there's a risk thing that happens there. There are people who skydive, and that's very different. That's an exhilarating for her. Time speeds up when she does things like that. So you study these things, and and how does this work? The general story is that 
when you're doing something that distracts you from thinking about time, because it's so much fun, it's a party or it's rock climbing, then things seem to go by very quickly. Uh, in contrast, when you're doing something that's very boring, like you're sitting on an airplane, you're checking your watch every few moments, uh, you're very aware of uh, the pace of time creeping along. What's interesting is that time in the forward direction is judged exactly opposite as time in the backward direction. You've laid down so many memories because it's so novel and exotic that when you look back on it, it feels like a much longer three-day weekend than any other three days that passes. So in the forward direction, it seems to go quickly. In the backward direction, it seems to have lasted. On the other hand, when you're in the plane flight, it seems to be taking forever. But when you get off, you have essentially no memories of it because there was nothing novel that happened. And so it seems to have gone by instantly. So when we talk about time speeding or slowing, we have to be careful which direction we're talking. What I study is the situations where somebody is in an emergency situation. You actually have special parts of your brain come online, specifically an area called the amygdala, which is your emergency control center. That commandeers uh, lots of other areas of your brain, and you achieve this, uh, this state that's uh, essentially an altered state that's unusual, we're not very familiar with it, and things um, are laid down in a very different way during that you experience things differently, and um, emergency situations seem to go slowly, they seem to have a long duration, and they're often characterized by a total calmness and a certain bizarreness also, where people are having completely calm, bizarre thoughts while they're you know, sort of falling off the cliff to their death. <laughs> I can talk more about that, but I see there are people at the microphone. Yeah, so. we'll get a question here, and then we'll come back. So go right ahead. I have a question for the, for the neuroscientists following up on this point about how um, our, our neural understanding of time is, is possibly fragmenting. And, and the question is this, um, when, when we think of one another, when we make a sense of one another's behavior, um, just to predict it uh, in everyday life, we attribute all these pieces of mental furniture like beliefs and desires and all these sorts of things, uh, this sort of folk psychology of, uh, of the mind. I'm, I'm, I, and there's been some debate, I guess, about whether as neuroscience matures, whether, rather than uh, saying of somebody, ah, they remember X, whether we'll say, ah, they had semantic memory of X or episodic memory of X. In other words, put it in the categories that we've learned from neuroscience actually makes sense in terms of the brain. And so my question to you is whether, as we understand how the brain parses time in, in this, in this uh, potentially fragmented way, will we actually understand one another's behaviors in, in a different light it, because of this? Interesting question, thanks. Um, you know, I, I'm very careful in all of my papers to talk about duration or simultaneity or temporal order, and I use these different fragments very carefully. What happens? And we're all guilty of this when we just start having a colloquial conversation, we just talk about it as time. But in fact, we should, we should split them up, just as we would episodic or semantic memory. Um, when we process uh, visual information about spatial patterns and so on, I understand that there are well-identified bits of the brain, the sort of the space bit, the bit that perceives space. Is it like that uh, with time as well? Is there, you know, this is the clock bit and this is the before after bit and so on? Can you pin it down like that? A uh, great question. It turns out no. Time, unlike the other individual senses, time is what we call metasensory. Because you can, I can play you a beep, beep, and, and show you a flash of light and ask you to compare the duration. And you can effortlessly compare things across the senses. And that's reflected in the fact that time is not stored in any area like the visual cortex or auditory, but instead it seems to be everywhere. And what I presented earlier today is a hypothesis that really subjective duration is an index of how much energy is getting used by the brain, brain-wide. It's an index of just, you know, the total amount of work you had to do to represent something. I, I hope that hypothesis is right, but even if it's not, it's that flavor that's going to be right, which is, has to be something that's not localized to any <laughs> one area. And I should mention, there's no brain lesion, there's no sort of place that someone gets a stroke and suddenly loses time. Right, yeah. We have one more question back here. Um, I'm happy to ask one. Uh, Raisa, um, you talk about phase transitions. Would you uh, be interested in uh, applying that notion to neural networks, to multiple universes, or to uh, evolution? Well, the easiest one is evolution, of course, right? So, um, so 
the multiple universes, I think that's a question that I'm going to leave towards to my cosmologist, but my understanding there is that every time that I would make a measurement, I would have to branch off into multiple universes. So we would view that as a phase transition because we've really had a major change in our, our, our system. And um, we often see these large phase transitions in complex systems. And this is um, something that I, getting back to the self-organization aspect as well. So we see fluctuations, we see these fluctuations grow in my perception of the flow of time. And I see that entropy is decreasing here locally in my system that's getting self-organized. So I see this interplay that order is happening here, disorder is happening there. And we often see that once there's sufficient order, suddenly it enables a lot of new behavior. So in evolution, we see this with like the um, Precambrian explosion. So we see these epochs where suddenly the change in the number of species just grows dramatically. So things sort of go along stably and stably, and then all of a sudden you have enough variety and diversity for things to come together and build explosive new kinds of life forms that we hadn't seen before. And I think we see this in a lot of systems that we see critical mass sort of forming, that there's a lot of variety and diversity, and suddenly they come together and enable a whole new kind of experience. Mm -hmm. That actually ties into a question I was going to ask you. Um, I was intrigued by, uh, when I was going through some of, the, some of your past research, that one of the things that you have looked at is you know, viruses, epidemiology, how diseases spread, but also how ideas spread. And of course, in the case of a virus, you want to understand that critical transition point to stop it. In the case of an idea, that could be a very, very powerful tool for you know, changing the world. Um, so how do you go about studying that, and how can your understanding of physics and this thermodynamical processes uh, that you're describing so, so, So I'm going to preface that by saying, I get asked that question all the time by marketing people. I'm sure you do. <laughs> they care. So they say, who do I need to give an iPhone 5 to? I'm, I'm surprised political analysts aren't calling you every day. <laughs> and uh, a, a fair amount of the work that I've done is looking at how to enhance or delay the onset of phase transition. So how can you do a small manipulation that might make it happen sooner or might make it happen later? And um, one of the things that we've noticed in these networks is that there's a broad diversity to the connectivity properties. So we have some nodes that are very extremely heavily connected and a lot of nodes that are lightly connected. And how those hub nodes interconnect with each other also makes a big difference. So if hubs are all in a dense mesh, they're all influencing each other, but they don't have a lot of extensive influence in other places. Whereas if they're more broadly spread out, we can see things really taking off like wildfire. And things often are structured in communities or clusters or modules. So this is another aspect that we see in evolution and in phase transitions a lot, that we have modular entities that can come together and share functionality. It happens in biology too, that there's a gene exchange between elements and between organisms, and they can absorb new functionalities. So we see sort of this modular structure. In social systems, we see a lot of communities. So um, one of the classic things is two communities in social systems. We see people with diametrically opposing ideas, and they only talk to people of like minds. <laughs> so we see this in politics. We see this in religion. Two groups very densely interconnected, very lightly connected between them. So a lot of these spreading processes have dependencies on what the exact nature of the system is, how the hubs are, whether things are modular, then suddenly these lowly connected individuals who span communities are the most influential ones. Excellent. Uh, we're about ready to wrap up here. I just have one more question to kind of throw out for discussion to the panel. Many of the talks over the last couple of days have cited Sir Arthur Eddington and his, his uh, uh, commentary on the second law of thermodynamics, that there's something special about the second law. If your theory, you know, disputes Isaac Newton, well then, too bad for Newton. You know, you might actually be onto something, but if your theory is found to be uh, in contradiction with the second law of thermodynamics, then there's no hope. You know, your, your, your theory is wrong. <laughs> and uh, I'd like each of you to comment a little bit, you know, on, on where, you, where you see the commonalities between you now that you've had a chance to really sit down for two hours and talk to each other. <laughs> I tend to divide the world into physicists and the rest. Uh, it's all stamp so, collecting to you. So, um, uh, you know, a lot of this vocabulary started out in, in, informally in everyday life. 
was appropriated by physicists who got in on the science game early on, and so they, and then they carefully defined those terms, like energy uh, and, and space and time and so on, the things that, that people still use informally. And, and uh, one of the bugbears of being a scientist reaching out to the wider community is that time and again people will use those words I inappropriately. And, you know, energy is one, and energy flows, and vibration. And they're not being used in the same same way as we use, with rather careful definitions. So having defined those things rather carefully, it's no surprise that other scientists, non-physicists, uh, will stick with those sorts of concepts and definitions of space, time, energy, force, entropy, things like that. I think, uh, broadly speaking, have the same meaning and understanding uh, in the other disciplines. Um. Yeah, I guess I would have to. I think that, that um, some of that commonality of language is a bit, unfortunately, a bit illusory, and maybe it's worth. I mean, especially entropy. This was a point that was made before um, by Sean at the beginning of the conference, and he was quite right. Um, there's this thought that entropy is a measure of order and disorder in the everyday way of, of speaking. Um, but the physics notion of entropy really doesn't track that. Um, and that can be a little dangerous because people think, oh, the second law of thermodynamics, this inescapable law of physics that we can't get around is telling us that entropy must increase and entropy is a measure of disorder. And so, you know, we're all bound for, for, for things to get worse, right? We're going to hell in a handbasket because of physics. That um, is the popular <laughs> conception. <laughs> right. And, and that's, just a, that's just kind of an abusive language because of this connection between order in other perfectly good, reasonable senses of the word, and saying entropy is a measure of that, that just turns out to be incorrect. Um, on the other hand, I mean, the notion of phase transitions is very deep, and it certainly appears in fundamental physics, I think in a very, as far as I can tell, a very uh, technically, mathematically, mm -hmm. you know, exactly the same way that you're worried about in higher level self-organizing systems. So there is, you know, there is commonality there. And, um, I don't know enough about the dynamics of neurodynamics to know how close the mathematics is. I was mostly intrigued by the fact that the brain seems to optimize energy. And, and, and yeah, as I said earlier this afternoon, we are mobile creatures. We run on batteries. And if you want to build anything like a simulated brain, you have to start with a simulated stomach because you know all what really drives us is hunger, and we get to energy sources and the pressure, the evolutionary pressure on us is to compute as efficiently as possible. And when you look at, um, my colleague Reed Montague did a calculation of the amount of energy being used by Deep Blue when he was competing against Kasparov. And Deep Blue is you know, hot to the touch and had hundreds of fans. And Kasparov is burning about the amount of wattage as a light bulb. Very, very freakishly efficient. Um, so, so yes, that's what, that's what brains are quite good at. But Deep Blue eventually won. <laughs> I think part of the issue, though, is that we're uh, kind of on this side of the table thinking more at a macroscopic realm. So you're thinking about energy in the classical sense. We're thinking about Carnot cycles. So work and entropy. And I think some of the very interesting connections are to information theory, where we can think about Shannon's notion of entropy, where he needed a probability distribution, but he also needed things to be in equilibrium for them to have a well-defined probability distribution. And likewise, in thermodynamics, we think of entropy as an equilibrium con uh, concept for the most part in the Boltzmann world. Uh, in the Gibbs world, sorry, Boltzmann was thinking more about the number of microstates consisting with some macroscopic property that we can observe. So I think there's this notion of scales, or with a macroscopic scale, or with a microscopic scale. And can we make this connection more clearly between information and physics and energy? And you know the story about Shannon. He didn't know what to call it and asked That's one right. moment. He said, call it entropy yes. because no one knows what that is anyway. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a beautiful work by Jane's where he showed the connections of how to get canonical ensembles. And stuff. I think that on that note, that's a good place to end. Let's thank our panelists.